All right. Uh, good afternoon and happy Halloween, everyone. As we speak, the Secretary General is at Parkey Synagogue in Manhattan at the invitation of Rabbi Arthur Schneier to attend an event entitled United Against Hate, Interreligious Leadership in Solidarity with Pittsburgh. Also in attendance are Cardinal Timothy Dolan, Archbishop Demetrius, Primate of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, and many other religious and local political leaders. The Secretary General just delivered remarks. He expressed his solidarity with the Jewish community of Pittsburgh and the world over, as well as the people of the United States. Anti-Semitism, he said, is the oldest form of hatred and discrimination in the history of the world. He told the audience that we must not only stand up and co combat anti-Semitism, but we must also be firm against the new rise of neo-Nazi ideas, which we are seeing taking hold in many parts of the Western world. He said there's not only a rise in anti-Semitism, but also in persecution and attacks on other religious groups, as well as refugees and migrants. Diversity, the Secretary General said, is richness and not a threat. But to make diversity work, we need investment in education and social cohesion. The Secretary General also took time to praise the work of Hayes, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which had been singled out by the killer in Pittsburgh. Hayes, Guterres said, is a fantastic organization that stands for everything that is good in society. Later this afternoon, there will be a photo op in the Secretary General's office for his meeting with Mark Hetfield, the CEO of Hayes. The Secretary General was keen to invite Mr. Hetfield to personally express his solidarity with the organization. On Thursday, the Deputy Secretary General will travel to Seattle to meet with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and its co-chairs to discuss global health and the UN reforms. The Special Envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffiths, welcomes the recent calls for the immediate resumption of the political process and measures to reach a cessation of hostilities in Yemen. The Special Envoy will continue to work with all parties to agree on tangible steps to spare all Yemenis the disastrous consequences of further conflict and to urgently address the political, security, and humanitarian crisis in Yemen. He urges all concerned parties to seize this opportunity to engage constructively with the current efforts to swiftly resume political consultations to agree on a framework for political negotiations and confidence-building measures. In particular, enhancing the capacities of the Central Bank of Yemen, the exchange of prisoners, and the reopening of Sana'a Airport. The Special Envoy is encouraged by the positive engagement of the government of Yemen and Ansarullah and will continue to work with all concerned parties in the region to reach an inclusive political settlement to end the conflict in Yemen. Meeting with President Maitrepala Sirisena today, the UN resident coordinator in Sri Lanka conveyed that the Secretary General is following the developments in the country very closely and with concern. As per his statement of the 28th of October, the Secretary General calls on the government to respect the democratic values, uphold the rule of law, and ensure the safety and security of all Sri Lankans. He urges the party to address the situation in a peaceful manner. Noting Sri Lanka's stated commitment to human rights, justice, and reconciliation, the United Nations stands ready to continue our cooperation and support in this regard. The Security Council held an open meeting on Ukraine yesterday afternoon. Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, Rosemary DiCarlo said that there has been little progress in talks to end the fighting, with the conflict in Ukraine now in its fifth year. She stressed that the Minsk agreements form the only agreed framework for a negotiated peace in eastern Ukraine and that the UN urges all parties to avoid any unilateral steps that could deepen the divide or depart from the spirit and letter of them. Ms. DiCarlo said that it is time for renewed and constructive action by all concerned to overcome the apparent impasse in diplomatic negotiations. Also briefing the Council was Ursula Muller, Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, who said that millions of men, women, and children continue to face dire humanitarian consequences in Europe's forgotten armed conflict. She underscored that these impacts are deepening as the situation becomes more protracted, noting that more than 3,000 civilians have been killed and up to 9,000 injured since the start of the conflict. Ms. Muller said that more than 3.5 million people will need humanitarian assistance next year, but that funding has steadily declined over the years. Today is World Cities Day. This year's theme is building sustainable and resilient cities. In his message, the Secretary General said that how our cities develop will have significant implications for realizing the future we want. He warned that rapid urbanization can strain local capacities, contributing to increased risk from natural and human-made disasters. But hazards do not need to become disasters. The answer is to build resilience, he said. 
to fl storms, floods, earthquakes, fires, pandemics, and economic crises. This year, the main celebrations are being hosted by the city of Liber Liverpool in the UK, and back here there will be a special event at 1.15 p.m. in Conference Room 11 on inclusive and resilient cities for sustainable families, organized by the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, DESA. In addition, DESA also launched a report which said that three in five cities worldwide, with at least half a million inhabitants, are at high risk of a natural disaster. You can find that online. I have the following pers personnel announcement to make. Bless you. The Secretary General is announcing today the appointment of Noreen O'Sullivan of Ireland as the Assistant Secretary General for Safety and Security. Ms. O'Sullivan succeeds Fazai Guadazimba of Zimbabwe, to whom the Secretary General is grateful for her commitment and dedicated service to the organization. As Deputy to the Under Secretary General for Safety and Security, Ms. O'Sullivan will be responsible for the day to day overall management of the department and supporting the Under Secretary General in the overall leadership and management of the department. Ms. O'Sullivan has over 36 years of experience in the international law enforcement and security environment and most recently held the position of Garda Commissioner of On Garda Shia Kauna in Ireland. We have more in a bio note in my office. And I just have another announcement. The Secretary General announced today the appointment of Ger Peterson of Norway as a special envoy for Syria. The Secretary General takes this opportunity to reiterate his deepest gratitude to Stefan de Mistura of Italy for his concerted efforts and contributions to the search for peace in Syria. Mr. Peterson brings to this position decades of political and diplomatic experience, having served both in government and United Nations capacities, most recently as Norway's ambassador to the People's Republic of China and as permanent representative of Norway to the United Nations. Mr. Peterson served the United Nations in various roles, including a special coordinator for Lebanon and as personal representative of the Secretary General for Southern Lebanon. He also worked as director of the Asia and Pacific Division in the Department of Political Affairs. And after I'm done, you'll hear from Monica Grayley. And then at tomorrow at 12.30 p.m., there will be a briefing here by Ambassador Ma Zhaoshu, permanent representative of China and president of the Security Council for the month of November. He will brief on the Council's program of work for the month. And then at 2 p.m., there will be a briefing by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Cuba, Bruno Rodriguez Parilla. That's it for me. Yes, Edie. Um, Hi, Farhan. Uh, one, f two, one follow up and one question. Um, will Miss O'Sullivan be the first woman to hold that high a position in the Department of Safety and Security? Uh, no, in fact, uh, in fact, her predecessor was a woman, Fazai Guarazimba of Zimbabwe. So, so she is she is uh, in in a part of a tradition now. Okay. Um, I wonder whether the Secretary General. Um, would still like to see an independent investigation into the apparent murder of um, Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, especially given the latest announcement by the Turkish prosecutor today that uh, he was killed as part of a premeditated killing, and his body was dismembered before being disposed of. He was that he was strangled, and that the um, Turkish prosecutors' meeting with the Saudi prosecutor had produced no concrete results. Uh, we are aware of the latest developments. The Secretary General's calls uh, still hold. Uh, you're aware he was uh, hopeful for. Uh, an investigation that will be prompt, thorough, and transparent, and uh, we still hold uh, to those guidelines. And uh, meanwhile, you will have seen uh, that the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, uh, also made a statement uh, urging uh, an independent investigation uh, yesterday. And, uh, and of course, uh, I'd refer you to her full statement. Yes. A follow-up or connected question. There has been a statement made by... Uh, seven UN human rights experts on this issue. I'll read one 
very short bit, most recently states and the international community, including the United Nations, have failed to address the enforced disappearance and murder of the Saudi journalists. The only way forward is to establish an independent, transparent, credible investigation into his murder, one authorised by and reporting to the United Nations. So uh, they are claiming the UN has failed by not setting up such an investigation. Uh, does the Secretary General still believe that he cannot do that on his own? Uh, we've explained uh, the sort of mandate we feel is uh, needed for an effective investigation to be undertaken by the United Nations, and, uh, and our position on that still holds. But does he have the power to set this up on his own? I've been consulting legal experts who believe he does. Uh, I, I spoke to the former um, U.S. representative, ambassador in large for war crimes issues in the Obama administration. He says the SG definitely has this power. Has the Secretary General approached the Office of Legal Affairs um, to see whether he has this power? And is the only reason he's not doing it is he wants some political cover for what would be a controversial decision? Uh, he, we have, of course, uh, received advice, uh, including from our legal office. But regarding that, uh, uh, it's clear, and if you've noted uh, the precedents from the past, uh, the uh, effective uh, commissions of inquiry that have been set up by the Secretary General have, uh, uh, if you uh, look at the historical record, uh, involved a mandate by a group of member states. But does he have the power to do it, Farhan? It's whether, uh, whether the precedents of the past had a, had a report, I, he, I, was, he, he was, it was referred to him, does he, does he believe he has a power under the Charter to do this himself? I, I'm, I'm telling you what our position is, which is that in order for there to be any effective uh, UN investigation, uh, those have required uh, uh, mandates by groups of member states. Yes, Abdul Hamid. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, today, um, Austria announced that it will withdraw also following the steps of the United States and Hungary from the uh, global compact on refugees reached in last July. Any comment from the uh, Secretary General? Uh, well, yes, we, we do regret this decision. Uh, at the same time, uh, I'd like to point out that the agreed text of the global compact uh, represents uh, the end result of uh, a lengthy 18-month process of consultations and negotiations among member states, and that's been supported by a broad array of uh, different parties, including uh, from civil society. Uh, although this uh, has been a decision taken by this particular government, uh, the broad number of governments have continued uh, to support uh, the process, including the vast majority of the UN's member states. And we look forward to interacting with them uh, in Morocco uh, on the 10th and 11th of December uh, at, uh, at the meeting where we expect uh, to adopt uh, formally the Global Compact for Migration. And, uh, and we hope and trust that we'll continue to in, uh, have uh, the widespread support of member states uh, during this process. Yes. Thank you, Farhan. Um, Yesterday, uh, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo have demanded that the Saudis end the uh, military operations in Yemen and proceed uh, with uh, peace uh, talks. Uh, my question, was there any uh, pre-negotiations or information to the Secretary General before uh, this announcement? And two, uh, what will be the role of the UN in this coming uh, period should the Saudis adhere to uh, Secretary Pompeo's uh, uh, demand? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure whether you were here when I first read this, but at, at the start I mentioned uh, that uh, the Special Envoy for Yemen, Mr. Griffiths, uh, welcomed the calls for the immediate resumption of the political process, and he talked about uh, the steps that he's going to take. Uh, there's a press release from his office with more details. If you what want. about the Secretary General? Was uh, the Secretary General uh, in consultation with Secretary Pompeo? Well, uh, I believe uh, we, we also made clear that uh, the Secretary General, among the topics that he discussed with uh, Secretary Pompeo last week when he was in Washington, uh, included Yemen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Farhan. Farhan, on this uh, Yemen thing, uh, I mean, we didn't have heard what Martin Griffiths said in the statement you just issued and so forth. What I'm saying is asking you, we keep on making there's similar statements on Yemen are being made. But there is no headway, nothing that has been done to persuade the Saudis to end the coalition to stop this. Uh, well, uh, not, not, not to dispute your account. I, I, I know heat. that this has been a very long-running war, and obviously we believe it has gone on far too long. But at the same time, 
the special envoy made clear today that he is encouraged by the positive engagement of both of the government of Yemen and of Ansarullah uh, to uh, the, the process that he's uh, put out. And he's working with them uh, to uh, reach an inclusive political settlement to end the conflict. And he has been working with other parties, including the Saudis, and hopes, at, 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 and at, hopes to gather them for talks uh, formally fairly soon. Yeah, I mean, uh, Farhan, at some point in time, is it going to be a firm state, I mean, a timeline given to the Saudis to somehow come up with some sort of a solution to the, not keep on killing the Yemenis all the time, as children in particular? We are trying to prevail upon all parties, and as you'll have seen uh, from the recent days' comments by other officials, including U.S. officials, uh, other parties are also involving the process to make sure that all parties halt fighting and, and come to talks. Uh, yes, please. Oh, oh sorry, if the car first. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, the UN human rights experts have been calling for the for clemency to the Pakistani Christian woman uh, who had been sentenced to death for Clemens, uh, for blasphemy. Uh, today, the Supreme Court of Pakistan set aside her death sentence and order her immediate release. But this has been, uh, there has been an uh, adverse reaction among the religious parties and right-wing groups who are demonstrating in the Pakistan. Any comments on the situation in Pakistan? Well, uh, among other things, of course, you're, you're well aware of our opposition uh, to the death penalty. So, so we would welcome uh, this latest uh, development by the courts. But uh, beyond that, I would leave the matter uh, in the hands of the court uh, system. Yes. Thank you, Farhan. Regarding the question of the uh, killing of the uh, COD journalists raised by my colleagues, there is a precedent, at least in one aspect, and that is that in the case of the death of Doug Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General has called for on states who have the information to turn it in for the investigation of the case. Would the Secretary General do the same with regard to the Saudi journalists? Would he call on a state who hold, might hold information to turn it to the investigator? Uh, I don't want to prejudge any role we may have down the line, uh, but I would like to point out, uh, since you brought up the case of Dag Hammarskjöld, that this was uh, another uh, qu question where in fact, we do have a mandate from a, a member state body, namely the General Assembly, to proceed. Yes. Um, coming, coming back to um, uh, the statement from the Special Envoy for Yemen, we have the words that you've given us and read again today from Martin Griffiths. We also have the transcript of what the Secretary of Defense of the U.S., Mattis, said. And Mattis seems to give us a few more details. So if I can ask you about those. He says that the talks will take place in Sweden. Can you confirm whether Sweden is offering itself as a venue? He says the talks will take place within 30 days. Is that your preferred timeline? Uh, and, and if he says that he thinks that it will take place, um, the Special Envoy talks about positive engagement. Can you tell us for the two key parties, um, the Saudi coalition and the Houthis, whether you actually have a yes to talks from either party at this stage? I think it's still early to say whether we have a definitive yes. I, I think as uh, uh, Mr. Griffiths has made clear, uh, we are working with the parties and uh, we are hopeful uh, of the indications we've received uh, both from the government and its supporters and Ansarullah and its supporters uh, that we can proceed ahead. Uh, Mr. Griffiths is hoping to be able to uh, announce a round of talks as soon as he can, but we're not at that stage just yet. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, I have a question on the uh, embargo resolution against Cuba that is being debated right now at the General Assembly. Uh, just uh, to have a reminder of background, can you please walk us through which has been the position uh, from the Secretary General on the blockade against Cuba, and uh, you know what has he considered historically about the blockade, and if there's anything or reaction to the reports that the vote this year might be delayed by the amendments proposed by the United States? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on the logistics of this, which is uh, something ultimately that's in the hands of the member states of the General Assembly. Uh, regarding uh, our position, obviously we want uh, General Assembly resolutions to be respected, and uh, this has been a resolution passed uh, by large majorities in the uh, General Assembly for many years now.
so that that's where we stand yes um, thank you Farhan um, on Guy Peterson's appointment when actually is he going to start work is he going to um, begin and overlap at all with staff and de Mistura? Uh we hope that he will be able to begin his work uh, as soon as he can once Mr. De Mistura has uh, left his, uh, his post. As uh, Mr. De Mistura indicated to you, he expects to leave uh, by the end of November, so we're hoping uh, that uh, the transition can happen uh, around that time. Uh, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Uh, then, then Abdul Hamid. Uh, there are many states who are taking a uh, higher position vis-a-vis -vis the murder of Mr. Khashoggi, for example, calling for disarming the Saudis. Germany took the lead, and maybe Canada and France. Why the secretary did not issue a statement even calling for the uh, halt, halting the shipment of weapons to the coalition until this issue is solved? I mean, his the, puzzles, the policy of the UN is to call for disarmament. This is an opportunity for him to issue a statement also putting his weight, moral weight, behind this armament issue. Uh, you will have seen what we've said about Yemen, and uh, we're following the, the process in order to bring both parties uh, to the table, and this is, uh, remains in the hands of, um, of Mr. Griffiths, and is an issue, an issue that is separate and apart from uh, our handling of uh, Mr. Khashoggi's case. Yes. Uh, it's a follow-up question on Ambassador Gare Pedersen and his mission. Uh, firstly, Will he continue to be based in Geneva? Will he inherit the same team? And is it the same plan? Or does he have the ability to, to look at a new plan? And also, if you could perhaps, many of us know Ambassador Pedersen, but given the difficulty of this job, and that he's the fourth special envoy, and they've included a former Secretary General, um, why did the, the Secretary General on this occasion decide to entrust him with this job? I think uh, many of you know him very well and uh, know exactly what his qualifications are. This is someone who is well versed uh, in the politics uh, of the region. He uh, has been uh, very adept at dealing with uh, member states and their demands in different capacities, whether as an ambassador, as a UN Secretariat official, or as one of our senior officials on the ground in the Middle East. And uh, And we believe he can uh, do a good job here. Obviously, uh, this has been a, an extremely frustrating war for reasons that are, are well beyond uh, the capabilities of even our most experienced diplomats. But uh, we are hopeful that the time has come to finally turn a corner and, and end this war. Uh, regarding how he will conduct his office, I will leave it to him to answer that once he takes up his job. Yes. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, the UN is no doubt aware of the incarceration of uh, prominent Kashmiri journalist Atif uh, Sultan, uh, who has been in jail since August uh, for refusing to reveal the source of his story. Uh, the, uh, the CPJ, the Committee for Protection of Journalists, the Reporters Without Borders and other national and international organizations have called for his release. Would the Secretary General join in that call? What I can say on this is obviously we would like uh, uh, the authorities in this case uh, to respect uh, the rights of journalists, including in particular the rights of journalists to go about their regular work without harassment. And with that, Monica, come on up. Thank you very much, Fahan. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. 